it should have never happened. Uh, honestly, uh, I, I don't do, do things at scale. I don't want a team. I don't want to be the head of a corporation. I've gone through the trenches. I don't know. It could, we could be an, an apocalypse or maybe we could be living on Mars. I, I just have no idea. <laughs> Activate your energy. Welcome to the Activated Authors Podcast, a show where we distill the core principles of what it takes to become a happy, healthy, and productive author, no matter what stage of the journey you're at. I'm your host, Daniel Wilcox. I'm an international best-selling author, as well as an author coach, speaker, and creative entrepreneur. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student of all things productivity, psychology, and human behavior. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. Without further ado, let's dive in. What is up, Activators? And welcome back to another episode of the Activated Authors Podcast with me, Daniel Wilcox, and oh my god like me, it's Sam been Fox. so long so long it hasn't it's been like a week since i've done this intro i can't even do it activators hello how's it going we're gonna keep this we're gonna roll because this is where we're at hello sam how's it going oh hi um how is it going good i haven't i haven't eaten lunch yet so if i get overly sassy that's why I, i'm yeah. just annoyed right because I went into my kitchen and because I'm trying to like make sure that I'm not consuming as much sugar and processed stuff and that's just because that's quite literally all I was eating before like I, just literally all I was eating was like just really bad processed stuff and sugar I've been I've, I've, I've fucked myself because I haven't bought anything that I can just quickly grab when I'm hungry and like yeah. my schedule's insane. So like I'm just sat here hungry. Like I guess I'm gonna have to wait to chop vegetables then. Am I? Yeah, I will apologise, but it's partly my fault for the times that we need to record this um, and the fact that I have to go drop off a car and do different things. So I apologise for taking up your afternoon and not giving you a break. But you know that is how how we work. Like you have to get this shit done. <laughs> And I apologise for my dog posturing and barking at nothing. Chase! Oh, my wife. And, and how are you? I'm doing well. I uh, had a meeting yesterday with uh, some people about a potential thing. And as much as I hate teasing, I don't really. Well, <laughs> I don't enjoy teasing. But at the same time, it's nice to have something to tease. But just the way that the way that this kind of business works is like, you know, th things will happen, things will present themselves. And then you kind of got to work, wait, th there's always, there's always like, I'm just going to keep filling while Sam has a breakdown. Uh, <laughs> there's always that, that moment where you, there's, there's a gap in which you can't always declare straight away. Cause you have to, you know, talk logistics. You have to like, make sure things are going to like actually happen before they happen. Make sure there's consent on all sides. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. So yeah. Like, There'll be there'll be some news in the in the coming months, but broadly speaking, like yeah, it's all it's all pretty positive. As I said last week, and you know, full disclosure, we're recording like twenty minutes after we recorded the bits for last last week. Mm -hmm. Um, I am fully independent now, which is nice to say. Also terrifying because you know it's all on me. Um, so I am at the minute trying to. <laughs> get... roll for you again. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to get my head around how that looks because i'm so used to burning the candle at both ends in order to try and reach that transitionary point to go independent mm -hmm. that a lot of that habit has remained with me so trying to consciously work on that it will happen i'm it'll sure it'll, time, it'll, but it'll, you'll get there yeah yeah i mean look at where you got already yeah doing all right oh my God. not so bad not so bad um i mean i'm yeah. on a diatribe but i won't <laughs> don't <laughs> don't um but yeah, so uh, we're back with uh, an episode this week with the wonderful Jay Thorne. We'll go into a little bit of that um, mm. shortly. But before we get into all of our guests and our, our usual uh, stuff, mm -hmm. Sam, what have you enjoyed this week? I enjoyed this week on Monday. Um, it was the first like full day that my son has been to uh, secondary school. So mm. he started officially on Friday, but that was um, like a... It was just year seven and the school just brings in year seven for a day so they can really get um so that's like seventh grade right yes yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> so they can just get like a lay of the land and it, it feels feel a little less intimidating so monday um and they play games and stuff and then so monday was like his first proper day at school the whole school was there like full-time table lessons all that kind of stuff um 
and we like we did that and then I had an appointment um which I won't go into <sighs> bloody pointless but when I got back we watched um the most random film I think I've ever seen um because Miles had seen it with his dad and he really wanted to watch it with me because he liked sharing things it loves with me which fills my heart with joy um and this film is called Hot Rod and it was brought out I think about 10 years ago now it stars um Andy Samberg and it's basically he is a stuntman a shit <laughs> shit stuntman who is trying to win the respect of his stepfather whom he keeps just like trying to beat up but he always gets beaten up by his stepdad instead um and it's just this story of <laughs> find out that his stepdad is um like has for the last 20 years had a really bad heart condition that they never told him about because they didn't think he could handle it and so and he finds out like seven days before like he's his stepdad's predicted to die so he's like right we're gonna put on this one huge stunt to raise the fifty thousand dollars you need for this transplant, and mm. then I'm going to kick your ass because I refuse to let you die before I've beaten you up. And it's just this, it's so fucking random and weird. Like at one point after he does this big stunt, like Ebenezer Scrooge like sticks his head out of the school bus and is like, "Goose for everyone!" Like it makes no <laughs> sense. It's so <laughs> random. It's I would almost say it's like not fully formed like it's quite jagged around the edges but like there are some moments in it that I like was crying with laughter um him falling down a hill in a forest is one of the goddamn funniest things I've ever seen in my life it hurt I was crying it was brilliant and it was just really nice because it was me and Miles and he was he wanted to watch it so we were just chilling together watching the film so that's why I've enjoyed this week I love it yeah how about how 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 how, how about you um two things really uh so one of them is uh I have bought and have been playing Elden Ring um and I say been playing I've, I've put a couple of hours into it it, it is a hard game I'm which... surprised to hear this is your enjoyed thing but okay yeah now the reason it's enjoyed is because I knew it was hard when I when I bought it and I kind of like heard a lot of um talk about you know what to expect with the game so i didn't go into like if it was a case of i bought it started playing it and just found out like what it was i'd probably put the game down by now but i'm really trying to put myself into a position in which i work through the hard things um mm. because without going into a whole diatribe about it like video gaming has gotten pretty easy over the last like couple of decades like i remember the days when you couldn't save a game and the levels were killer and you know you get like three levels into something with a hedgehog and then you die and have to start the whole thing again and there are like 20 levels or whatever it is um and then now you've got things like the Lego games, which are unlimited lives. Like if you die, there's checkpoints like all over the place. So it's like it's nice to play something a bit more challenging. But a I'm really trying grown to... up game. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm truly really, like I'm trying yeah. to. Well, you say that, but then uh, I've got the latest Crash Bandicoot, um, Crash Bandicoot Four. Crash. Something about time. I think it might actually be the no, might actually be uh, whatever it's called. Um, and that is really really difficult. It's a beautiful game. It's such an homage to Crash One and Crash Two and Crash Three uh but it's it's really really hard and like you forget when you played these early games how many times you had to fail to succeed mm -hmm. and so yeah like it's it's enjoyable in the sense of like it's motivating me back into, and it's a beautiful game and like there's some really like cool things in it um i think just generally this week has been a bit of a fantasy theme because uh, elden rings like dark fantasy and then i've watched the first couple of episodes of the sandman uh the neil gaiman comic that's got turned into uh the netflix show and it's a it's it's a beautiful uh viewing experience and the story is really really good it's very very game and um so yeah sandman and elden ring for me as a, a bit of a killer combo i can't believe i didn't say the rings of power but oh yeah rings of power week, is pretty dope that was last week that's why mm. yeah but yeah very very good yeah um weekly wins so this week uh our win will go to the incredible pan 
who Ooh. has just got his manuscript back from his editor. I say just got back. Um, yeah, kind of just got back. But like, this is a huge milestone just because of how long he's been working on this book, how big this book is. And just not only that, but the feedback that have come back, like he seems to have found the right editor. And obviously I'm not going to go to all the specifics of it because it's not really my story to tell. But suffice to say that like, that's a massive milestone for, for Pan and to work forward with the feedback that he's got is like, he's got it. He's got it. Yeah, amazing. So, okay, congrats. <laughs> so Sam, would you like to introduce this week's guest who I've already introduced that we're going to reintroduce through yourself? Yeah, I would. So the interview you're about to hear is with the uh, grandfather of indie publishing. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. I meant to say godfather, but grandfather came out and I'm, I'm sticking it's with the it. It's the beard. <laughs> it's the beard. Uh, Mr. Jay Thorne, um, he... Like he, he's he's incredible, and uh, there is a lot in this interview, um, and I think you will all enjoy it very much. He's doing all of the things, um, so I'm sure some things that you're doing will be mentioned in there because he is doing all of the things. So yeah, yeah, uh, put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Over to the interview with the incomparable Jay Thorne and the all right Wilcox. <laughs> <laughs> Jay Thorne has published two million words and has sold more than 185,000 books worldwide. He is an official member of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, the Horror Writers Association, and the Great Lakes Association for Horror Writers. Jay hosts the Writers Inc. podcast with J.D. Barker and Zach Bohannon and has interviewed some of the today's most successful authors, including Matthew McConaughey, James Patterson, Dean Koontz, Seth Godin, Joyce Carol Oates, Hugh Howie, Andy Weir, Jodie Picot, Nicholas Sparks, Lee Child, Stephen Pressfield, Chuck Palahniuk, and many more. Thorne earned a BA in American history from the University of Pittsburgh and an MA from Duquesne. Is How do you say that? Duquesne. Duquesne University. <laughs> is a husband, father, full-time writer, part-time professor at John Carroll University, founder of the All for Life community, podcaster, FM radio DJ, musician, and owner of the Three Story Method editing agency. And I'm very, very proud to say a close personal friend. Jay, how's it going? Oh, it's so great to talk to you again, Daniel. It's been, it's been too long. It has. And I was actually looking back at when we uh, last kind of spoke. And so uh, the last time we spoke was because we've done it a couple of times over the years uh, was on the Great Right Share podcast. We had an episode in which it was a short mini sode. We sort of spoke about three story method. But the main one which I spoke to was actually very, very early in 2020. And I'm going to ask a question to you that I've never asked anyone on this podcast. Oh, because, no pressure. <laughs> because at the time you were podcasting with Rachel in the right as well. You were doing the career author with Zach. Uh, we were working on some stuff for Moulton Universe and you were doing some publishing stuff there. So my question to you, Jay, what has stayed the same? <laughs> oh, my goodness. What stayed the same? Well, that's an easy question to answer because it hasn't been very much, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I, I just just before we got on, I was having a, a chat with uh, uh, Jeff Elkins and I was saying to him like 2020 feels like a lifetime ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 kind of hard to wrap your head around how much change we've all been through over the over the past couple of years and and how like uh, how I, I just struggle to like even anticipate what five months out is going to look like versus five years like coming up with a five year or 10 year plan right now. Feels it's like impossible. It's it feels like writing, like writing epic fantasy. Like, you know, <laughs> it's like, I don't know, it could, we could be in a, an apocalypse or maybe we could be living on Mars. I, I just have no idea. All both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think in all seriousness, like um, I, I think what has stayed the same is that uh, my approach is still very blue collar workman, like, which is you get up, you do the work and you release yourself from the outcome. Like you, you just can't control how, how things are received. You can't control how things uh, sell. All you can control is, is your production. And so that's what I focus on. Mm -hmm. It takes me. So um, I, I go back and listen to old episodes of podcasts where I speak to different people, just because I like to see like who I was like three, six months, years ago. Um, and I remember having a, a question with Sasha on the next level authors podcast, where it kind of covers that exact thing. We, we ask ourselves, are you where you thought you would be? And every time I think of that, and every time I listen to that podcast, I'm like, no, like it's never where I thought I would be, but it doesn't mean that I don't love where I'm at any less because of it. Um, and as I say, we were obviously, this was pre-pandemic. And I mean, obviously the, the pandemic is going to be a big part of everything, but we don't have to focus on that specifically. Um, but you were in a very, very different place. And so, I mean, probably the best way to start really would be to say, 
what are you up to these days? What does a life in the a day in the life of Jaythorn look like? What kind of projects are you working on right now? Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking about how to answer that because I, I want to acknowledge that I'm I feel like I'm working from a a bit of earned privilege right now, which is probably different than when when we spoke earlier. And I want to explain what that means. So. Mm -hmm. Um, without getting into a big history lesson, I, I left my my full time day job in in uh, 2017. It's been five years, and <laughs> I know crazy, right? Um, and one of the first things I did was I I went into debt. I I hid the charge on the on my credit card for my wife, and I paid for StoryGrid certified editing uh, certification, and I started doing client work. And uh, fast forward over those five years, I've worked with. Um, hundreds of clients. I've, um, uh, I've built up a community, um, mostly through podcasting and, and client work. And I'm to the place now where I am certifying other editors and I'm sort of, uh, running a, an editing agency, so to speak. And so what I say, when I say earn privilege, what I mean is like, I've, I've gone through the trenches on the author services stuff. And I feel like I'm now entering the phase where I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm working more on the business than in it. So mm. my day to day looks a little bit different. Like I'm not necessarily um, scrambling for clients anymore. Um, uh, I'm not trying to develop leads for clients. What I'm looking at now is how do I elevate people within the community to start doing client work, to start doing editing? Like that's what the three story method editing program is all about. Now, I mean, full transparency, they're paying me for that certification the same way I paid Sean Coyne mm -hmm. for StoryGrid. But my, my business model has, has shifted because I have earned some success in, in the services over the past five years. So I, I just want to put that little caveat on the answer. Because you're humble. No, but it's very, like, totally get where you're coming from. I really like that um, because, as you said, the shift from working uh, in to on the business, I'm definitely in the trenches of in at the minute. I'm doing a lot of like It's a lot of that groundwork. And yeah. I think especially when you're going into the um, sort of services side of things, that's definitely a consideration when you start off and going full time into that arena. You have to build that up to then be able to elevate and, and do everything else you're doing. When you when you talk about elevation, what does that look like from the inside? Because is it, you know, how how heavily do you have to manage and run and sort of look after the people that are you know editing on on behalf of the three-story method it depends on how you set it up uh the way i've set it up and this this is i'm not divulging anything confidential here but the way i've set it up is the the people who who come for the editor training for me it's it's a it's an immersive weekend uh uh in in real life they come to cleveland and we spend a weekend together and i go over everything from editing to to business model to mindset approach um they're already in my community so so we have slack channels we have monthly calls um and that, that's what i provide in exchange for them paying for the certification once they're certified i don't take any percentage of any work so uh i have i have a page on my website with all the editors and anyone who hires any of the editors they deal directly with them the editor gets a hundred percent of of any of that that's just a, that's the choice i made on the model i wanted because mm -hmm. For one, I think that's the I think that's a fair model. I think if you're charging uh, someone to educate them, which is totally legitimate, then then um, they deserve the right to then uh, you know benefit from that. And if they're if they're paying you a percentage or a kickback or a finder's fee, I I don't really feel like that's fair. So so that was that was the model I chose. And then selfishly, I don't really like to manage people. Mm -hmm. Which sounds odd, like when you run a community, because that's mostly what it is, is managing people. But it's one of the reasons why I don't do, do things at scale. I don't want a team. I don't want to be the head of a corporation. I want to do everything myself because I just don't want to manage people. Mm -hmm. I totally feel that. I'm on the, on the cusp at the minute of potentially looking at venture, which would mean management of people, which I have very, very mixed feelings about. Because yeah. on the one hand, I really enjoy just like you say, just being in control, it's that kind of like self, you, you only have to worry about number one, like everything else kind of like ticks along. Obviously there's some bits and pieces, but nothing too heavy. And then on the other side of that, it's like, and I'm, I'm teasing that whole thing here because nobody knows this yet. Like, well, I select a few people, but like, if I do go down that route, it's in order to achieve what I want to achieve, I'd need to, like, there is definitely a certain path that would need to happen. But um, you mentioned a couple of times about 
the author life community and you know i'm in there i've seen it at work i think it's like an amazing place for authors to get involved in to Thanks. learn to meet other authors talk a little bit about how that all began and kind of its journey to where that's at now yeah well you you mentioned a few minutes ago the importance of of being in the trenches and if you're if you are building towards something you have to start by serving people directly mm -hmm. The, the problem with that is it's hard and people don't want to do it for very long because it's very draining. Uh, I don't know what your experience has been, but when I was doing one-on-one -on -one client work an hour a week, I was more of a therapist than an editor. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, like uh -huh. it was all about like, how do I get to the page? How do I get my, my husband to understand this is important to me? Mm -hmm. How do I get past my imposter syndrome? It was rarely about like, you know, your use of adverbs or, or you know, mm -hmm. the obstacle your protagonist faces. And because of that, it's, it's hard work. It's draining. You got you to gotta show up. You have to be 100% there. You can't phone it in. Like you're, you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, whether that's in person or over Zoom, it doesn't matter. It's intense. It's intense emotional work and it's hard. And so people, they don't want to do that for very long. Um, there's, there's an initial excitement. Like when you get your first client and someone pays you, that's, it's a nice ego boost. And you're like, all mm -hmm. right. Like, and you feel good and you should feel good about that. But once you get into it, you, you understand that it, it's hard work. And so I, um, I knew that going in because I'd been a teacher for decades and I know that, that dealing with students, whether they're adults or not is, is hard. And, and, uh, and I did it for years. Um, and the reason I did it for years is because I, uh, first of all, I needed that experience, but more importantly, that's what set the, that's what planted the seeds for my community. If I had just started with a community, I wouldn't have known what people needed it for. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason I knew what the, uh, how the author life could serve authors is because I, I had hundreds of clients who told me week in and week out, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I'm having problems. And when you do it enough, you start noticing things consistently. People start saying the same things. They bring in the same problems. They have the same concerns. And at a certain point, you realize that the one-on-one -on work, one -on -one work might not be sustainable, but you can, if you can build a community and that community can support people in these ways, then mm -hmm. you can help more people. And you don't necessarily have to be um, showing up for, the, for those calls every week. Because there's also the, lo the logistics issue with that, which is how many hours do you have? Yeah. Like, you know, you know, are, Paying, you know, getting or paid per hour is sort of a necessary evil, but I don't think it's where you want to end up because there's just a natural limitation to that, whether whether in time and or what you can charge per hour. So it wasn't my plan. Um, I, I didn't think when I started doing client work, I didn't think like in three years, I'm going to start a community. It naturally evolved that way. But what I tell people is like if whether it's in the author community or any other community, if you want to be a good community manager, if you want to create a place that's useful for people, you almost have to do some version of one-on-one -on -one client work for some specified mm -hmm. amount of time so that you know what they want. Yeah. Well, the other side of that as well is as the people join into that community, what I found is they support each other on the things that we're asking you for support. So it actually becomes, and, you know, going down that route of beginning through the one-on-one -on -one route, you're bringing a certain type of people and, I, I don't know how you manage it, but like the actual growth of a community, very, very difficult if it grows too quickly because you really need to manage the culture inside it. So how have you cultivated the culture of the author life? And, and what does that look like to anyone who hasn't experienced this kind of community before? Yeah, ours is probably not a good example, uh, <laughs> only, only because it started out as a paid community and now it's a free community. Uh, so uh, Chris Kane, uh, I brought Chris Kane on as my uh, partner in crime for the community. And uh, this might have been six months or so after I launched, and I think I launched it in 2020. I think I think it's been almost two years now. And uh, the community was forty dollars a month. And what what we eventually came to realize, especially with the pandemic, with inflation, with the global situation, was that was a lot. That was a lot for your typical author to invest. Um, we felt it was worth it, but we also recognized that there were global extenuating circumstances that was making it challenging for people to to afford that um on the other hand uh you can't run a community for free because <laughs> then you never get any of your work done like you know there has to be some sort of of balance there so we recently kind of changed the model a bit in that uh i am soliciting uh partners in the publishing space um i, I hate to call them sponsors because they're more like they're more like partners but we've mm -hmm. we've brought in 
uh, the folks at Vellum and uh, draft to digital and AutoCrit and Google Play Books. And they, uh, they help um, compensate Chris and I for running the community, which then in, turns, uh, in turn allows us to make it free. Now, the, the catch with the free is that it's not just free and open. Uh, people can apply to be part of the community or they can be referred by an existing member of the community. And to answer your question, that helps us to regulate the flow mm -hmm. of incoming members and to uh, maintain the culture um, that, that we've set up. It's definitely a long-term thing. Uh, I think building a community is not something you're going to, you, 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 you have to be willing to stick with it for a few years, I think, to, to really see if it's going to uh, move the needle for you. Um, but that, that's sort of been the evolution of it. So my role is mostly the community manager and Chris focuses more on the content side. Uh, and so that, you know, I, I, I'm in there every day. Uh, I'm in there uh, reacting, commenting, setting the tone. Uh, luckily, there have only been a few instances where I've had to step in um, uh, with uh, inappropriate comments or situations that have kind of gotten beyond the, the ethos of the community, but those are very few and far between. Um, and uh, so that, that's kind of how we've been doing it so far. And I do want to jump over as well, because we only have a limited amount of time. And you have a lot of plate spinning. Uh, the Writers Inc. podcast. So again, the last time we spoke, you were podcasting with Zach on the career author. You were doing uh, Write as well with Rachel and a few other projects as well. Um, and then you partnered with JD and began the Writers Inc. podcast. So tell my listeners a little bit about that podcast and, and what you've got going on. That's been a, uh, a crazy thing. Um, it, <laughs> a it, little it, bit. It should have never happened. Uh, honestly, um, you know, I, I didn't know JD before Thriller Fest 2019. I mean, I knew of him, but we didn't, we never had uh, interacted. And I was at Thriller Fest and, uh, and, and basically said, Hey man, you want to do a podcast together? And, uh, <laughs> and he was like, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, he, he's like, I got a lot going on. Uh, you know, I, I, I really can't make that commitment. And I was like, okay, you know, that's fine. And, in subsequent follow-up emails, he eventually said that he wanted to get better at public speaking, and he thought that podcasting would be a good way to do that. And so the arrangement was, I would do all the all the heavy lifting. He would just kind of have to show up and talk. And when we were discussing the format, he was really a big fan of Mark Dawson's format, mm -hmm. where uh, James Blatch does the interviews, and then Mark comes on in in the in the wraps and uh, it sets it up, and then and then talks about the the takeaways. And I was like, Yeah, man, I I can totally do that. And it just so happened that JD um, has an amazing uh, list of contacts in the industry, uh, as you've seen, because most of the guests are ones that he's, he's gotten. Um, so it works out pretty well. Uh, I've gotten uh, a lot better at interviewing. I feel like I, ha I have a pretty good uh, idea of how to, how to manage uh, the interview. So JD, um, he, he, gets, he lines up these great guests and I interview them and it, it, it was a great pairing. And then at one point we were like, kind of felt sorry for Zach so we're like, well, <laughs> let's throw the guy a bone. He's not doing anything. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it, it was, it was, I think it was a natural thing. You know, when the mm -hmm. career author ended, um, it really made sense. And, and Zach and JD and I have really developed a great rapport and I mm -hmm. couldn't imagine doing it without Zach now. So the three of us, uh, you know, we, we I, I still do all the interviewing and then the three of us get together and, and talk about pre and post and, uh, and that's the show. Mm. Now, I will say that watching the evolution or listening, I should say, uh, the evolution of the podcast has been really exciting from from the listener perspective, because as you say, like those those early episodes very much like trying to find the format, but you still got these like amazing guests. The guests have obviously like grown and you've had some like amazing names on there. Um, and yeah, when Zach when Zach came on, it really did balance out your three different styles because you're, you're you've all got different personalities you've got different goals and aims and i think each one of you in some way represents a different area of the writing community and i think that that blends really well um not to blow lots of smoke up your ass but i do think your the, your interview technique is fantastic and i think you get a lot out of those conversations that is is very worth people listening to um Thanks, and i one of my big questions for this and you've probably been asked this a thousand times when are you getting king <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be up there. That's got to be on your bucket list. Yeah. Oh, it is. And I, and I, can, I can tell you uh, without getting specific, uh, this is top of mind for JD. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so he is, uh, he, he's been working on it for years and who knows, like it may never happen. Um, I'm, but I'm, I'm always like waiting to pick up my phone and see that 
see that text from mm-hmm. JD that says, Hey, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> King is you know? the building. Yeah. I, I don't know. So uh, yeah, it certainly would be, it It could almost be like a, a Chris rock mic drop moment when like, mm. cause if you interview King, if you look at who else we've interviewed, like that's, that's kind of the, the big one. As far as we, I'm not saying King is, is the, is the best for everyone, but as far yeah. as our interests go, yeah, he's, he's the guy we creme want. De la creme. Yeah. <laughs> so you say that you um, approached JD at, at Thriller Fest and said, would you like to start a podcast? Where did that come from? What was that? What? Because you've met him for the first time at ThrillerCon, and I'm guessing there was some sort of chat preluding this, but how did you get onto the subject of let's start a podcast? You know, I, I heard him. Uh, well, so what I saw him on a panel and, and the name jogged, uh, he, his name jogged some memory and I, and I went, I was like, Oh yeah, that's the guy that did draw cool. And, mm-hmm. and I was like, Oh, and you know, we're about the same age and, and we had a lot of the same interests. And so I started, uh, I started stalking him uh, and Googling them and stuff. And I, and I heard him talk on, uh, it was Dawson show. He was a guest on, on Dawson show. And I was like, you know what, this guy's got a lot of really interesting things to say and he doesn't really have a platform. Like he's not, He's not blogging like he didn't have a podcast. And I was like, you know, the author community could learn a lot from this guy because Mm -hmm. he was and still is hybrid. Um, You know, he's got Kristen Nelson's one of the one of the best agents in the world. And and she takes his books out to the biggest publishers in the world. And yet he still he still self-publishes. He does his own ads like he just had a lot of experience. I thought people should be they should be hearing this, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um I, from what the way I can remember it, and you know, this story changes every time I retell it because that's it, how your memory works. <laughs> uh-huh. But we were, it was happy hour at Thriller Fest, and he was surrounded by a bunch of people, and I was just kind of standing there waiting for my turn. Um, and and I think when I approached him, uh, you know, I, I love doing podcasts and have, have done a number, and I and I think I basically said that to him. I was like, listen, I, I've heard what you've been doing. Like uh, your, your interview on, on Dawson's podcast was great. I think you got a lot of great things to share. The author community would really benefit from it. Um, you know, and I think that was my pitch. Now I didn't know that he was thinking about using podcasting as a way to sharpen his public speaking skills. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was just serendipity, but, uh, but that was my approach. It's like, I, I sort of identified, um, I identified him as a really potential great podcast host. And, and that's where the idea came from. Mm, I love that. And I just love, you know, taking that chance and just asking. Like, I think so many people are afraid to just ask the basic questions and they don't give people the chances to say no because they worry it will hurt them. But no, no it's not going to hurt a person. It might wound your pride a little bit, but like opportunities like this can then flare up and happen and, and who knows where it takes you. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, you know, JD has Asperger's. So he, he's, um he's very direct. Like this is, this is, you know, part of being on the spectrum is like he, he kind of just says what, what he thinks and he has this fearless attitude. And, and this is what comes out when he books guests. He, he's not afraid to ask anybody. Like no. he will ask, it doesn't matter. Like he, I think he, he was trying to get Bill Clinton at one point. Like he he's, he's fearless, you know? <laughs> and, and so I think like, that's, that's kind of the approach you have to have. Like the, the worst thing that someone's going to say to you is no. And then, and then you're no worse off. So I think if you, if you make an ask or you pitch someone who you consider to be a little further along the path than you are, if you do it respectfully, mm-hmm. um, I, there's no harm in it, you know, and, and the more you do it, the better you're going to get. Mm. And for yourself, what is it like almost being on the other side of that curtain? Because I mean, obviously, as you say, you've run a lot of podcasts, you've spoken to a lot of people over the years from different areas of publishing. Um, but with writers, I think it does seem to be this sort of really top caliber. You're getting some like, amazing guests in there that are almost part of this other world what is it like for you to have a chance to sit down and interview those people and what are some core nuggets of advice that have either surprised you or kind of just things that are recurrent among all writers regardless of you know what it is that you do yeah well um no one else is going to hear this so i'll i'll, I'll tell you uh right this isn't this isn't going on anywhere, anywhere publicly <laughs> no, no, this is just me and you <laughs> all right all right uh, uh you know that it's kind of the secret i don't like to talk about too much because it feels really self-indulgent to me but I get to talk to the most successful authors in the world one on one. And like I, I sometimes I can't believe it's happening, you know, like and you know, I, I there was a, a bit of luck involved there. Um I think my my previous life as a teacher equipped me to to be able to ask really good questions and so um when people come on the show or they hear others interviewed, they they want to be on it because 
I'm hopefully not asking the same questions in the same way, or I'm giving them the opportunity to showcase something that they don't all, always get a chance to talk about. Um, but what's, what's really interesting for me is that I would say seven out of 10 times when we stop the recording, there's another conversation that takes place. Yes. And I'm, I'm so grateful of that. I've gotten, and, and I, I can't get too specific about it, but like, I've gotten pieces of, of advice from people that probably shaved years off of my author experience. Mm -hmm. And like, I'll be completely honest. I haven't published any fiction in years mm -hmm. and that's not because I'm not writing. I, I have, I have maybe 250 to 300,000 words of, of fiction done that I haven't published. And the reason I haven't published is because I'm, I'm in a, I'm, I'm figuring out what I'm going to do next and I'm basing that a lot of that on the conversations I'm having with people after the camera stops rolling. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I don't want to rush into it. Like I'll hear something. I go, oh, okay, well, I'm going to pause on that one because so-and-so talked to me about this. So th those, uh, most of those authors who are coming on are so gracious with their time. And when the camera is done rolling, they're like, tell me what you're working on. Like, wh what are you doing? And I tell them and they're like, oh, you should X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And it's priceless. Now, I mean, the flip side is, uh, you know, I haven't published fiction in, in a number of years, but I kind of feel like the next time I do, I'm really taking my best shot because I've got this collection of the world's best authors who have kind of helped me in micro steps along the way. Mm. I love that so much. And it actually uh, takes away one of the questions I was going to ask, because as, as you mentioned, you went from, um, I want to say a phase, but obviously you and Zach were writing pretty fast. You were writing pretty hard a few years back and there was a lot coming out and obviously there was a lot of push with Molten Universe Publishing. Um, and now obviously you veered more into the author life and the three-story method and, and writer's ink and everything else. Um, so it, I, I kind of assumed that you were still writing along alongside that as well, but uh, it's it's nice to hear that you're almost like absorbing a different approach and I'm excited to see what comes out when you do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've had a few false starts. Um, so there were twice so far in the past couple of years, I thought like, okay, this is my next fiction project. And then I learned something that uh, either about the market or about myself that made me think, uh, maybe not. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I, we talked a little bit earlier about sort of the earned privilege. Uh, you know, I, I'm in a position now where I don't have to write fiction to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So I can be patient. And, and I can, I can have a hundred, hundreds of thousands of words sitting on my hard drive and not feel compelled to get those into the market. Um, so I think it, yeah, it, it's, it's been the, where I'm at now, I feel like I'm, I'm as close as I've ever been, um, to, to that new project. And I, I don't think there's anything I'm going to hear in the near future. That's going to change the trajectory of where I am now. And it, it's, mm -hmm. it's going to be more of a, um, a, a secret pen name, uh, and a, a bit of a different, uh, angle. So I don't, I don't want, I'm not comfortable talking about it publicly at this point, but, mm -hmm. uh, I feel really confident that, um, all the research I've done and all the conversations I've had behind the scenes has really brought me to this point where like, this is, this is going to be my next best step. Curiouser and curiouser. I will ask, cause obviously at the beginning we mentioned, um, you know, it's really difficult to plan five years out, 10 years out because I don't even think it's, well, obviously a big chunk of that is the pandemic, but I know that just, I think part of being an entrepreneur, part of you know running different businesses and trying to to find which is working puts you in lots of different directions. Um, I know that speaking for myself, that I went full time in 2019, and where I am now is nowhere near where I thought I'd be. And again, like like I mentioned earlier, it's not anything that like I'm unhappy about. I really enjoy what I'm doing and and whatnot. But how do you how do you view planning and how do you view change, considering how dynamic you've well had to be maybe is the wrong word, but you've been over the last few years with various different changes. Yeah, part of it is a is a pretty traditional answer, and 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 uh, that that is our our friend Joanna Penn, who's always mm -hmm. talked about the importance of multiple revenue streams, and mm -hmm. um, so like that at its core, I think that's what it comes down to. Um, that means you got to generate a ton of ideas because ninety nine percent of them won't, aren't going to go anywhere; they're going to fail. Uh, and uh, having having those multiple revenue streams makes you less vulnerable. Uh, in that if one of them goes down, then, then, you know, um, you, you have, uh, you have some breathing room there. Um, but as far as the, the state of the world right now, especially the state of our industry, uh, I look at everything as a one-off project. Like I would love to be able to create a productized service 
that I could bank on for five years, but that's just not the world we live in. Um, you know, I could launch an event or a product or, um, a course, uh, and it might do really well right now. And I could relaunch it next year and it could, it could be crickets, uh, same with books. So I think my mindset going in now is that, uh, I want this thing to work and if it works great, um, if it works again, that's even better, but I have no expectation that it will. Huh. Interesting. I like that, but it's also, it almost feels like there's no way to have a foundation beneath you. And I guess that's where, yeah, I'm kind of comparing to my idea. I guess that's where kind of having that, that bottom line, um, what's the word? Having that financial security blanket does help to then be able to roll project to project to do that. Um, so I guess part of that is building that foundation to begin with. Yeah. And the foundation for me is a small mastermind group that I run just within the community. So, mm. you know, the community has got, I don't know, 240, 250 people in it right now. And uh, twice a year, I run a, a program called Publish in Six, where I take folks uh, over six months, take them from nothing to publishing a book. Mm. And um, that's and that's only for 10 people uh, for each cohort. So um, that that's sort of my foundational activity, the thing that uh, I really need to, uh, that will allow me to work on, on these other projects because it's an expensive high ticket, um, experience. And I know that most people aren't going to do it, but because I'm, I do things that don't scale and that they're really small and I don't have a team, um, with eight or 10 people or 12 people, uh, twice a year, um, that's enough to kind of, uh, you know, sustain my lifestyle and, and my wife and I, and my family, like we we're, we're pretty minimal. Like we, we, we live a very low key lifestyle. Um, we, we don't spend a lot of money. We don't buy a lot of things. And so um, if you, you know, our buddy Zach always says, if you can control your expenses, mm -hmm. uh, you can get to that full time uh, creative position a whole lot faster than if you are, um, you know, spending a lot of money. Based off of uh, one of the most recent episodes of Writers Inc., I think JD's wife should listen to that advice. <laughs> <laughs> the Amazon order, right? Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, what advice would you tell yourself? going back to 2017 when you did go full-time what what is there something that you would tell your 2017 year old self would you change anything or would it be kind of the same uh i don't think i would have changed anything um you know i i often talk about um annie duke um annie duke wrote a book she's she, i don't know if you're familiar with her she used to be a uh, uh a world champion poker player and I, I, it's, I think her, the title of her book is something like living in bets or playing in bets. I forget what it's called, but she, she talks about this concept that poker players have called resulting and it's a trap, right? So what they do is, and I'm going to tell you this and you're going to be like, well, yeah, of course that's common sense, but it's not. So stick with me here. <laughs> what she says, what they'll do is they'll analyze a game and when they get trapped in resulting, they will base their decision on the outcome of it. And that's mm -hmm. wrong, all right? Here's all right, so like let's say they, they play a hand, and and the hand and and they lose. They were like, well, that was a bad decision. What she says is, and 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 I believe in this 100. percent I think I've heard this story before, but carry yeah, on. yeah, it's um there are there are variables within the decision making process that are out of your control, mm -hmm. and therefore you can't base the outcome of a decision. Uh, you can't base the quality of your decision on the outcome. Mm -hmm. All you can say, you can base the quality of your decision on the amount of information and homework you did at the moment you made the decision. So when the player sees the cards on the table and they're making the decision about how to play the hand, as long as they're following their best practices, as long as they're not doing anything rash um, or, or risky intentionally, or they're not ignoring clear signals, then that was the best decision, regardless of whether or not they win the hand. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, that fundamentally changed the way I think about everything, not just business, but my entire life. I, I fell into that trap of resulting so many times where I would make a decision and then I would see the result and then I would judge the decision based on the result. Yeah. And you can't do that. There's, there's luck, there's variables outside of your control, there's other people involved. And that takes a tremendous weight off of your shoulder. <laughs> so when people ask me, like, would you do anything differently? I'm like, no, absolutely not. I, I made it at that decision at that time, and I'm not judging it based on what happened. I'm judging it based on how I made the decision. So if your decision-making 
process is solid foundationally, then you should never second guess any of your decisions. I love that. I think that is, yeah, incredibly powerful. And it, it might also, I'm just having a moment in my head in which, um, so people ask a lot sort of about my writing process and publishing books. And I always find that like, as I, I always say, the reason I'm so confident in my books is because I've given them everything. And I know that I've given them everything and there's nothing else I could have done. Um, so, you know, whether they're received well or whether they're not, that's not really up to me. As long as I've done everything on my part to make the best product I possibly can, there's a certain contentment around that and kind of um, a satisfaction in going like, obviously you want to push it, you want to market it, but however it's received, that's out of my hand because I couldn't have done more. If I know that I could have done more, then I should have done more. Yep. You're giving it all that you can. Yeah. And, and I tell you, you were involved in a, in a project like that for me. Like we, mm -hmm. we tried the American Demon Hunters uh, series and I put my all into that. Uh, you know, I, I, de I designed that from the ground up. Um, I, I wrote the novel. I brought in uh, co-writers like you to mm -hmm. write these novellas that went along with it. I did paid advertising. I hit my list. We, I, I did everything. I did everything I possibly could. And that project just was an epic fail. Nobody wanted it. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, I would not have changed anything differently knowing that like, I'm not happy that it failed. And obviously <laughs> yeah. like you don't want to be in that situation, but it wasn't the result of the decisions that I made. I feel like I made the best decisions. I did everything I possibly could to make it successful. Mm -hmm. And there's just a certain element of does the universe want it or not. And I, and I think authors who put that kind of pressure on themselves are really doing themselves a disservice. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if it was as simple as sitting down and, and making the right decision to write a bestseller everyone would do it and every book uh -huh. would be a bestseller. <laughs> it's never that simple. Never that simple. Um, but you brought me on to um, a point as well that I wanted to ask about your marketing, because I know that you've come off of social media quite hard over the last couple of years, pulled away from that. And I don't blame you. I'm definitely on that journey myself and minimizing a lot of the platforms and things that I'm doing just because the reward isn't worth the input that it's currently finding with, with the stuff I'm doing. How do you approach your marketing strategy how do you reach people how do you you know investigate to see what is worth exploring at the minute yeah not well i i, I haven't <laughs> done that well i mean you know the last time i released uh, a fiction book uh, a fiction series that was uh with zach and uh that series did really well in ku um we did we did some ams ads um but we you know we didn't we didn't do we didn't do much beyond that and because I haven't published a, a work of fiction since, I haven't really been forced to, to deal with those. And um, one of the things I'm doing with my next fiction project is I need to, I need to re-educate myself on paid ads. Uh, mm -hmm. I hate doing paid ads. I the hate sketch. managing them. I hate paying for them. But I have also recognized that in the current indie market, it's pay to play. Mm -hmm. It just is. You're just not going to sell a book on word of mouth only. Um, on Amazon. It's just not going to happen anymore with the exception of, you know, a, a few people here or there. Mm -hmm. So part of my plan is, is to go back and just grip my teeth and be like, this is part of what I'm going to have to do. I don't like it, but it's going to be part of what I have to do. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to it. I don't think social media is in the, in the cards for me. I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think the return on investment is worth it unless I was going to do dances on, on TikTok and nobody wants to see that. <laughs> so, uh, I do. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I, 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 am just gonna, uh, probably not Facebook ads. I think Facebook ads ROI is questionable at the moment, um, at best. So, uh, it's probably going to be AMS ads. Um, I'll probably go pretty heavy on those at the beginning of this project. I would eventually like to then hire someone to manage those, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to revisit that and I don't want to, but that's, that's how the game's being played right now. Mm. I'm finding it really interesting at the minute, the amount of questions I'm getting asked about TikTok and, you know, um, writers and authors advertise themselves on tiktok and how it is the thing you must do in order to sell books and it just makes me laugh because i've been in marketing since i don't know 2013 2014 and already in that cycle there's been like vine there's been instagram there's been snapchat like it cycles around and obviously like there's a time and a place for people on those platforms if you can make it but it, it's it's hilarious to me that it's still like the be all and end all for, for some people and they haven't yet seen that you know there's a whole plethora of things that people can do outside of the one thing that's trending right now trending is the right word isn't it mm -hmm. you've seen it you've seen you've seen the trends and in you know those in the audiences don't transfer i think that's that's the reality yeah. that people have to understand like just because you have a great following on instagram doesn't mean they're going to come over to tiktok mm -hmm. so if you if you over resource whatever's trending at the moment and you can cash out good for you like awesome 
double down on it, but don't expect it to last and don't expect to, to port those people over to whatever the next new thing is. Mm -hmm. We briefly mentioned uh, in this episode about events and, you know, you do live things, you you like to get people in person and to run certain events for people. How important are events for authors now, particularly post pandemic? Questionable. <laughs> mm. uh, I, you know, the, the pandemic uh, basically destroyed uh, one of my revenue streams along with Zach. I mean, um, you know, we, we tried, we tried doing the career author summit um, twice and, and, and just weren't able to get enough interest for, for very legitimate reasons. You know, people still weary of traveling uh, different mm -hmm. parts of the world. People can't, there's still uncertainty. Um, authors on a train. I mean, that died a, a quick death. We, we had the last authors on a train and a few weeks before the world shut down. And uh, I don't see it coming back anytime soon. I mean, we'd love to, but it's just, it's a different world now, it's, you know, um, even up until a few months ago, you had to wear a mask on Amtrak. So like, it, you know, it's, it's, it's been devastating. Um, mm -hmm. The flip side to that is there's certainly no shortage of online events, but I think there's just a fatigue with those now, even the best ones, you know, we've, we've all been on zoom for years now and, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you know, like uh, it's hard, it's hard to create something virtual that is uh, that's going to be worthwhile that people are going to tune into. And, and most people don't tune in live. And then the statistics on the replays are, are, horrid you know it's like almost no one like they say they will almost no one watches any of the replays for, for many events so it's really questionable right now i mean it i love doing the really small personal events um and i i would love to do those again i would love to do the world building weekends i would like to have a summit i'd love to do authors on a train again mm -hmm. um but uh right now it's just not the time for it interesting not where i thought you could go with that but makes sense i wonder if um you know, there's potentially more of a lag, obviously, over in the States as there is in the UK, because I went to a like a Horror Writers Association event in the UK a couple of months ago, and it was revitalizing for me on my side. I don't know if that's just potentially like the landscape as it is at the minute, obviously, like how different things were handled across different countries and whatnot, but interesting. Well, you know, um, I did go to Thriller Fest in May, and I went to NFT NYC a few, few weeks later. Both of those were in New York City, and, um, and those... Personally, I loved it. I was great. I mean, even as a hardcore introvert, I was great to be like back with with people again in in a in an exciting setting like that. But the numbers, specifically for Thriller Fest, uh, the numbers compared to their pre pandemic mm -hmm. registrations were way down. Um, so you know that was a pretty good indicator to me that that you know there are a lot of people still aren't even in the states still aren't aren't ready for that. Um, but I'm moving forward. Like I, I'm going to a, a, a business conference in October in San Diego. I bought my ticket for, uh, for um, StokerCon for, hey. for next year mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. I mean, that's my, that's where I was born and raised. So it was a no brainer for me. So uh, it's going to take time though. Like I, I mm -hmm. and there might be some people who never just never go back. Like, I think there are some people who have realized like, I don't want to invest in the flight and the hotel and the time. Yeah. I'll just attend <laughs> virtually. And like, that's fine. You know, um, so it remains to be seen. I mean, that being said, everything's so unpredictable right now. Everything could snap back in nine months. And uh, I just mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah, I missed out on a few big conferences I was really looking forward to just because of many, many cancellations. But yeah, you live, you move forward. Um, what's in the pipeline for Jay Thorne? What's coming up in the future that you're excited about? Yeah, I'm. Uh, this is a bit of a polarizing thing, so I, I don't want to go too far into it. <laughs> <People> <laughs> But you look at your uh, your metrics for the podcast and see everyone just drops Shoot. off right at this minute in the podcast. <laughs> Honestly, it's the Web three stuff. It, it's the blockchain, mm. the crypto space. Um, you know, regardless of what you what you think about it, whether you think it's a Ponzi scheme or envi environmentally destructive, like these are all things that people said about the internet in the early two thousands. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of similarities there, and I, I'm not out to convert people. Like if people don't care about NFTs and Web three, that's fine. Uh, do do your thing. But I see it as as big of or bigger uh, of a revolution as the internet was, and I was, you know, I was um, I was 20 years old in 1991, and um, I can tell you that th th what we're going through right now feels a lot like it did then, hmm. and I think it's gonna I think it's gonna radically and fundamentally change our day to day lives. I think people are going to operate on the blockchain and not even know that they are. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of scariness and protocol and, and, and lingo that flies around right now that scares people. And it was the same way in the early internet. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I can remember when people 
would never purchase something online. I'm not putting my credit card online. Are you kidding me? Right. And, and those kinds of things are happening right now. So that's what I'm excited about. I don't know if it's ever going to hit publishing. I don't know if reader behavior is ever going to lend itself to a Web3 experience, but uh, many aspects of being a creative and an artist will. And that's what I'm most excited about. Mm. I like that. Yeah, I've heard them um, because I kind of kept my ear to the ground with it probably a lot last year, less so over the last few months. But like you say, there's so much there's so much talk. There's so many people using different you know pieces of vernacular that just don't make sense to, to the layman. And you know, we're, we're operating on many, many servers that we don't understand how it works right now. And all it is is the people who do understand how it works, trying to figure out how it should work going forward. Yeah. Everyone yeah. else, don't, you don't have to worry about it right now. Like you can talk about cryptocurrency, you can talk about everything else. Like you don't have to understand it. If it comes, it'll come and you'll find a way to work it around. Like it's, you know, the same, I was listening to um, a podcast earlier where someone was saying that this was 1989 and they had uh, a cell phone and were basically getting shouted at through uh, the window of cars for people just saying it's never going to catch on that they're idiots and obviously everyone has a phone in their hand <laughs> now and you can't go anywhere without one so the world will change yes yeah i mean if you look at the history of technology especially in the last 50 years and one thing that we know for certain is it never stops mm -hmm. it's not going to go away just because some people don't like it yeah Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to round up that conversation with a question that I ask absolutely everybody that comes on the show and probably one that you've asked answered before, but it'll be interesting to see how your uh, your answer has differed. Why, Jay Thorne, do you write? Yeah, I, I think I always go back to the, the same thing, which is I can't not write. Mm -hmm. I just can't. I've tried. I've tried setting <laughs> aside um, fiction a number of times. Even very recently, I tried setting it aside. And I just can't. I think part of me is a is a storyteller. Um, I think music and and uh, the written word are the t are my two mediums of choice, and uh, I just can't not. Perfect. Okay, so tell my listeners how they can find you. Any of your links, anything you want to share before we round off for this episode? Yeah, easiest thing is just go to theauthorlife.com. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have a one hundred percent free community. There's no strings attached. You just got to apply. So. Um, if you're interested, head on over there and uh, and we'll bring you into the community. And yeah, that's it. That's where everything lives uh, is theauthorlife.com. Perfect. Highly recommend it. I'm in that community myself and there's so much value in there. So definitely grab it. But Jay, thank you so much for joining me and for giving me some of your time today. I appreciate it, man. Always good to talk. No worries. Take care. And that was our interview with Jay Thorne. Sam, what did you make of that? <laughs> I loved it. I love him. This is a running team. I'm aware of it. I don't care. <laughs> um, I've got some notes because I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget. So let me put on my um, glasses that I did not choose myself and I'm not a fan of. Um, first of all, can I just say I was very I was a great fan of his T-shirt that had zombie run on it. And mm. it it does not surprise me that that would be something that interests him. Yes. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did have a little chat about that in the in the pre-talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I captured on that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was a couple of things that I really enjoyed. Um, I, I really, really loved this idea of him being really open and honest about earned privilege. Mm. Because I think a lot of the time um, we, we hear interviews with people who are where we might like to be ourselves. Um, and you know a lot of the, the advice and other stuff is is amazing but it's easy to forget that they now can do these things um, because they have this time um, and so you know you can beat yourself up because you're not doing that but also the fact that he used the word earned privilege mm -hmm. and really explains the fact that it is earned because he's been where like you are now mm -hmm so to speak. And like he, like he said, you know, he's gone through the trenches. Yeah. He's, he's earned the right now. He was working full time as a teacher, also doing his writing business, podcasting. He's been he's been grinding and working at this since I think it is 2010 was the first published book. Yeah. So, yeah. Earned, and I earned. can tell you, that is a long time to work on something. That's when my son was born. <laughs> so, but yeah, I really, I really love that. And I, I just think, like, like I say, twofold, it, um, it really spoke to me and I think speaks to kind of his character. Mm -hmm. The fact that before he answered the question, he felt that he needed to give that as a disclaimer, kind of, yeah. you know. Um, Wait, it, it, go on. <laughs> no, 
it's just that thing of, um, you know, I'm still relatively new to, uh, I'm going to have to stop saying that soon um, Hmm. because I'm getting old. But in the sense of, you know, like I've not published and I, so there's a lot of the kind of after stuff that I'm not really familiar with and and all the rest of it. Um, Nor was I in any way um, knowledgeable of the indie community at all outside of like Jenna. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jenna uh, Moresi, basically. Um, you know, I knew of her, but outside of that, I really didn't know anything. So one of the one of the first few names I heard coming into this was Jay Thorne. Yeah. Um, but this is really the first time that I've I've seen him just like talk because I know you've interviewed him before I know he's on everything I know he's got all the books and all the things but much like with um a few other authors when when people keep telling me that I must do something I'm like cool I'm gonna not do that yeah um but actually it was, just, <laughs> it was beautiful to 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 watch that interview and you're like you know your chemistry together as well yeah I um, think as well just quickly before you you, you jump on like um kind of on the earned privilege thing like it is so transitionary and it is so slow and it's so individual based on you know how hard you attack something what your circumstances are so again like earned privilege is is perfect just to set that context of like what i'm doing now i've already done that pre-stuff so like Mm -hmm. if you're doing the pre-stuff now this won't necessarily work for you like a lot of the mindset stuff is transferable um but yeah and then also in in previous conversations and i don't mean this in any way like negatively but like there was something that Jay was um, selling or pushing or really, really working on. And he seems to have reached a place in which he doesn't have to push so hard to do that kind of stuff. Um, And as I say, not in any way negative because the conversations I've had before, like I've just, I've loved. Um, But yeah, there does seem to be a much more of a kind of just an open, just here I am just talking race to to the conversation. Yeah, Yeah, it was beautiful. Um, I also, I had a little bit of a a realisation um, because of this so when he was talking about like getting paid per hour and he he says um he was talking about the one-on-one coaching and he says the phrase you know but like how many hours do you have mm-hmm. um and like I've been wrestling with something this week um I've purposely set myself a, a really well to my brain like easy light schedule because it's like my first full week kind of back in the saddle um and I've I've found that I've been like procrastinating or just kind of sitting down staring at a wall quite a lot, um, which is something I generally do on my off time. Uh, and I realised that actually I need more time than other people. I need more space than other people. That's part of just how my brain works. And like I can't just come in from one thing and immediately like you know get a coffee and sit down and start on that I, I can't I need like after the school run I get back and you know I, I get back now at, at like almost 20 to 9 and by the time I actually start working it's about 10 because I need that much time to like have what's just happened wash off me then have a period of almost nothing and then start to feel that like prickle of you should be working now what hmm. that thing I need that otherwise I can't focus um and I also realized that I work so much better uh, realize this thing but like I work so much better at night hmm. it's not really an option for me at the moment I mean obviously there's the sprints but I, I'm talking like I I love the night more than an early morning like on so many different levels like I say it's not a, not an option for me right now because I've got a kid that you know needs to get to school and stuff mm-hmm. and I need to not die from sleep exhaustion <laughs> um, but it just it gave me I don't know it just cemented that thing that I I've been I've been wrestling with but hadn't really and um, so that was like huge for me just him saying that and also just this idea of sticking with things like made me so happy because we're so like like trigger happy aren't we like we're gonna I'm gonna try this and after two weeks, like I'm not an international, like no name or bestseller, but burn it to the ground, start mm-hmm. something new. And I just love the idea that he said, like, you've got to stick with it for a few years before you want to see if it's moving the needle. Because like, 
actually building something worth building takes, takes time. time. Mm -hmm. Like there's a reason McDonald's buildings, generally speaking, unless they've adopted an already standing structure, are not beautiful. It's because yeah. they come in Lego pieces and they're made in like a week. Mm -hmm. But the Sistine Chapel took a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's just... I just that and when he was talking about like resulting and decision making and I've no idea, idea really what NFTs are or how they have <laughs> the environment um but yeah I just I, I enjoyed it start to finish it was a joy to listen to yeah sorry and, I rambled <laughs> yeah and and you know the thing with with Jay is that he puts his money where his mouth is like he when he says he sticks to the same process, he's very blue collar. He gets up and does the work, like mm. he does, and you know that's never changed as long as I've known him. And I'm pretty sure that we might have first connected in possibly 2016, 2017. Um, very generous of his time, very like knowledgeable and like great at what he's doing with the stuff over at the Author Life. And yeah, he's just he's just kind of like an all round fantastic guy. And I think just that conversation for me. The one thing I found very interesting was uh, the attitude on events. It's yes. obviously changed. Wasn't expecting that because yeah. I know that, as he says, like events was very much his bread and butter. And given what I've seen from events in the UK, it might just be a bit of a, a cultural difference at the minute on you know where different people are across the world with uh, COVID releasing and, and not releasing. That's the wrong word. Um, COVID Release restrictions COVID. lifting. <laughs> Release the COVID. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it's, I don't know. I, I just always get a lot of value um, talking to Jay because like, it's just a very definition of just transparent and honest yeah and like humble yeah like the dude does very 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 well yeah um, he's very smart very intelligent very practiced um and yeah in a in a world in which you know there are people out there that are you know wearing a mask and pretending like things are easy when they're not and just putting on this veneer and stuff like as hopefully listeners of this show now and people in the community you know like that's one of the things that i really try and bring is like just that honest transparency with what it is to be an author yeah. um the earned privilege thing being like the perfect example but like he has definitely been for me someone that i've i've watched over the years sort of learned from benefited from you know spending time with him and um, with any luck should hopefully be meeting him for the first time in the flesh next year of course it's stoker Con. yes so oh. we, will, we will see uh, i need to i need to get there uh hopefully actually get out of this goddamn country for the first time in like five years yeah um well longer than that but yeah um loads in there if you've not checked out what jay's up to and all, all that he's about like tremendous things if you've not checked out the writers inc podcast what the hell are you doing he's had literally some of the biggest names in writing on that I'm show to listen to all this stuff now it's really annoying i should have just paid <laughs> attention when people told me in the first place but i was just so stubborn uh-huh uh-huh i'm the same uh -huh. as you though like the minute people tell me like harry potter lord of the rings like anything that i've enjoyed over my life like in, in a big way i've been very resistant to get to it because it's always been like you have to do this yeah and i'm like do i, I to do anything do I? Mate? Not me. Not me. But yes, so um, we don't have a current guest lined up. We will be kind of out of whack again with scheduling. We're just figuring out behind the scenes some of the stuff that's going to be going on over the next few months. Um, mm -hmm. Keep an eye out on on wherever you find us for more of us. <laughs> <laughs> but as always, uh, we are over at the Activated Authors community, so activatedauthors.com. You can try out the community for 30 days, absolutely free, no obligation in and out if it's not for you if you do love it then we're here for it um loads of stuff going on but yeah until until next time i will say bomb oh. unless you've got something going on sam no no go for it okay a massive thank you to you for tuning in <laughs> we appreciate you and the time you choose to spend with us each week and as always if you're looking to level up your writing and activate your author career head on over to activateyourauthors.com to find out all about our community our resources and all that we've got going on until next time we will see you Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>